On October 28th, at 4.47 p.m. in the occupied Zaporizhia region, what would become known as the $127 million train strike commenced. A complex Ukrainian operation, the primary target was a high-value Russian ammunition train. The attack vector involved a swarm of 12 long-range FPV, or first-person view, drones. These were reportedly modified for fiber optic control and were advancing toward the target at a steady 97 kilometers per hour. Simultaneously, Russian counter-battery radar detected the launch. The electromagnetic signature generated by 48 brushless motors powering up in unison was immediately flagged by Russian Electronic Intelligence, or ELINT. Minutes later, the first 152mm artillery shells from a Russian battery began landing, with the initial impact 800 meters from the Ukrainian operator's suspected position. The operators faced a critical decision. Abort the mission and relocate, or continue the attack while under direct artillery fire. Based on the target's speed and distance, the operators calculated an approximate 12-minute flight time to the intercept point. They assessed that the Russian artillery battery required roughly three minutes to correct its fire and achieve a direct hit. As the drone swarm closed the distance, a Russian BTR series armored personnel carrier at a static checkpoint visually acquired the swarm and initiated an engagement. The vehicle's heavy machine gun tracers arced through the afternoon air. In response, the swarm's pre-programmed tactical logic activated, splitting the formation instantly. Four drones increased altitude, four descended to nap of the earth level, and four maintained their median course. The BTR's barrage passed through the now dispersed formation, failing to score a hit. The critical element of this operation was the drone's control mechanism. Each drone trailed a fiber optic cable, thinner than a fishing line, back to its operator. While Russian Electronic Warfare, or EW, assets were simultaneously flooding the spectrum with an estimated 10 kilowatts of jamming interference, these cables provided a physically hardened data link. Transmitting control signals via pulses of light, they were completely immune to radio frequency jamming. This rendered the multi-million dollar Russian EW systems in the area tactically irrelevant against these specific assets. While the drone swarm proceeded, the Russian artillery barrage intensified, having acquired the operator's precise location. The second shell impacted 600 meters away. However, the Ukrainian operators had prepared for this specific counteraction. Their control station was not a single point of failure, but a distributed network of three separate, hardened bunkers spaced 500 meters apart. This specific distance was a key tactical calculation. A 152mm high-explosive artillery shell generates a lethal fragmentation radius of approximately 300 meters. By spacing the bunkers at 500 meters, even a direct hit on one position would leave the other two completely unaffected. This redundancy ensured that even if the Russians managed to destroy one, or by extreme luck two, a surviving operator group could guide the remaining drones to the target. Subsequently, the third artillery round impacted 450 meters away. This strike, while not a direct hit, proved consequential. Shrapnel, traveling at speeds exceeding 1,500 meters per second, severed the 8 mm thick fiber optic cables of drones 2, 5, and 8. These three drones immediately switched to their backup systems, battery power, and conventional radio control. This transition instantly made them vulnerable to the intense Russian jamming that the other nine drones were ignoring. The operators in Bunker 1, now under direct fire, executed their relocation drill. As the fourth artillery round slammed into the earth just meters from their position, the team was already sprinting through a pre-dug connecting tunnel to a fourth, fallback bunker 700 meters to the east. The Russian artillery would now be forced to reacquire their new position, a process that would consume critical time the drone swarm did not have. The nine drones still connected by fiber optics remained completely immune to the electronic assault. The fundamental physics differed. Jamming radio frequencies to disrupt a light-based signal is ineffective, as the radio frequency spectrum and the light spectrum do not interact in this manner. 
The three drones now operating on radio backup, however, were immediately targeted. A Russian R330Z Zetel electronic warfare vehicle, positioned at a nearby rail junction, had detected the swarm at 7 kilometers. It activated its primary transmitters, flooding frequencies from 100 megahertz to 2 gigahertz with 10 kilowatts of electromagnetic energy. This was sufficient power to overwhelm all commercial drone control channels, GPS signals, and radio communications within a 30-kilometer radius. The effect was instantaneous. The three drones running on radio backup went dark. Their operator's screens turned to static. Inside the Zhitel's command cabin, the Russian operator observed his waterfall display as the system saturated every frequency. On his scope, three hostile signals vanished. However, nine others continued, their data links impossibly clean. Confused, the operator cycled frequencies, attempting to find a band that would affect the remaining drones, but to no avail. A critical, indiscriminate effect of electronic warfare then emerged. The BTR-82A crew at Checkpoint 9, having recovered from their failed engagement, could see the swarm approaching on thermal imaging. They attempted to radio a warning to a Pantsir S-1 air defense system three kilometers away. Their military-grade radios, however, were met with the same wall of static as the Ukrainian drones. The Zhitel's massive jamming bubble was as effective against Russian communications as it was against the enemy. The Russians had effectively blinded their own sensor to shooter links. On the ground, the train engineer, briefed on possible drone activity, pushed the throttles forward. The 4,000-ton convoy accelerated from 42 to 56 kilometers per hour, the maximum safe limit for the aging track. This acceleration, however, created a new problem for the Ukrainian operators. Every kilometer per hour gained by the train shifted the calculated intercept point 17 meters further down the track, forcing continuous recalculations that consumed precious battery life. The BTR crew at Checkpoint 9, despite their jammed radios, attempted a second engagement. They had an eight-second window as the swarm crossed their position perpendicularly. The gunner attempted to calculate the lead angle for targets moving at 27 meters per second, requiring an aim point 15 meters ahead of the lead drone. He opened fire with his PKT machine gun. However, the drones executed random pre-programmed evasion maneuvers. By the time the gunner calculated the proper lead and walked his fire onto the flight path, the swarm had passed behind a tree line. The primary defense now fell to the Pantsir S-1 air defense system at the rail junction. Its radar, designed to track cruise missiles and aircraft, filtered out the tiny drone signatures as ground clutter. The operator immediately switched to electro-optical, or thermal, mode, manually tracking the incoming swarm. At 3,200 meters, the Pantsir's twin 2A38M 30mm autocannons opened fire. The gunner employed an anti-drone tactic, programming his 30mm shells for airburst detonation. Each round was set to explode at a preset distance, creating a 4-meter sphere of shrapnel. Firing at 5,000 rounds per minute, the system was creating a wall of metal fragments. This tactic was immediately effective. Drone 6 vanished in an orange fireball, followed seconds later by Drone 11. The seven surviving drones executed their next programmed response, scattering in three dimensions. Three climbed to 200 meters, three dove to grass height, and one jinked laterally. This forced the Pantsir operator into a split-second decision. The system's computer recommended engaging the high-altitude group, as they were easier to track against the clear sky. His training, however, dictated engaging the closest threat first. The operator prioritized the high-altitude group, elevating his barrels. This decision, however, aligned with a known tactical error, failing to engage the most immediate threat first. While the Pantsir's guns tracked upward, chasing the climbing drones, the low-altitude group accelerated towards the train, unmolested. The gunner realized his error, but could not traverse his weapon system fast enough to reacquire the low-flying threats, which were already passing his optimal engagement angle. As the drones closed, a platoon of Russian infantry at Observation Post 7 opened fire with 40 AK-series rifles. This was a near impossible shot. The drones, moving at 27 meters per second, spent only 0.74 seconds in any single soldier's sight picture. Factoring in human reaction time, 
at 0.25 seconds and target acquisition at 0.5 seconds, the drones were gone before a soldier could effectively aim and fire. Simultaneously, four specialized drones that had been holding at a 500 meter altitude dove toward the railroad tracks, 800 meters behind the speeding train. They released their payloads, thermite charges. Thermite, a mixture of aluminum powder and iron oxide, burns at 2,500 degrees Celsius, far exceeding the 1,370 degrees Celsius melting point of railroad steel. The charges ignited on impact, transforming four sections of track into molten metal. This secondary operation effectively cut off any path of retreat for the locomotive. The Pantsir's barrels, glowing cherry red from sustained fire, reached their thermal limit. Modern autocannons can only maintain their maximum rate of fire for approximately 45 seconds before heat warps the rifling, rendering them inaccurate. The gunner was forced to cease fire for cooling, creating a 12 second window where the sky was clear. The seven surviving drones pushed through. Battery warnings now flashed amber. Drone 3 reported 18%. Drone 7 reported 21%. They had perhaps 20 seconds of powered flight remaining. At this moment, smoke from the thermite charges, carried by the wind, drifted across the battlefield. Thermal imaging cannot penetrate carbon particle smoke. For several crucial seconds, every Russian defense position lost visual contact. The drones punched through the smoke at 1,400 meters from the target. Their fiber optic cables approached their maximum 12,000 meter extension. One by one, spring-loaded mechanisms released the cables. The drones were now on their own, on battery power, and too close to be jammed. At 1,530 meters, the train engineer saw the seven black dots. He slammed the throttle past its mechanical stops, overriding safety governors. The diesel engines redlined, but the driving wheels lost traction and began spinning, polishing the rails. The train, in fact, lost two kilometers per hour of speed. The Pantsir attempted one final engagement, but the drones had entered its 500 meter minimum range. Its autocannons could not depress below negative five degrees making it geometrically impossible to engage the ground skimming targets. Soldiers at the final checkpoint opened fire, but the drones were now using the 600 meter long train as cover, flying low along the tracks. To hit the drones, the soldiers would have to shoot through their own train. At 100 meters from the target, Drone 3's battery died. Its props stopped but its momentum, calculated by the operator, was sufficient. It glided the final distance on physics alone. Russian combat engineers were seen attempting to decouple Wagon 22, but the coupling was under 4,000 tons of tension and designed never to release under load. Drone 9 was hit by a lucky burst 400 meters short. Six drones remained. The mission plan had accounted for 60% losses. The margin was still positive. At 4.59 p.m., the lead drone, armed with an RPG-7 warhead, slammed into the coupling between the locomotive and the first wagon. Its shaped charge created a 2,800 meters per second jet of molten copper, shearing the massive steel pin. At 4.59 p.m. and 18 seconds, the final drone struck the ventilation system of Wagon 22. This car contained 12 tons of TOS-1A thermobaric rockets. The warhead impact pushed the internal temperature, already high from vibration, past the 447 degrees Celsius auto-ignition point. The resulting fuel-air mixture detonated with a pressure wave propagating at 3,000 meters per second. Wagons 20 through 24 were vaporized. The blast wave lifted wagons 25 through 47 off the rails, flipping them across the countryside. The mushroom cloud climbed to 1,400 meters. In just 12 minutes, the low-cost drone swarm, with an estimated value of only $4,800, had neutralized Russian military assets valued at an estimated $127 million. This successful operation severed the primary rail line supplying three mechanized divisions, critically disrupting their preparations for an impending assault. 